Hi, what are some of your outdoor recreation interests? Maybe you enjoy fishing or perhaps more adventurous snowmobile ride through the woods. Alternatively, maybe you're an urban adventurer and want to do a bike ride through the Twin Cities. Regardless of what you like to do, your choices in recreation and environmental related behaviors have multiple influences. This presentation shares perspectives and organizing frameworks for those influences. These influences can be understood from a variety of perspectives encompassed in the human dimensions of conservation and natural resource management. Recall earlier in the semester when we introduced you to, or perhaps reminded you of, the number of disciplines involved in this. I've shown a few here. Social psychology and psychology, sociology and human geography. Each uses different theories and methods that align with it. As you've prepared your assignments for this semester, most likely you've encountered one or more of these disciplines and you've been exposed to their methods and theories. Similarly, you've been exposed to different variables and understandings of how they relate to recreation behavior. Recreation and, behavioral, recreation and conservation behavioral research largely draws from and builds from these theories. Influenced by expectancy theory, this simple visitor satisfaction model reveals the three categories that influence visitor satisfaction. The resource, the managing institution, and the visitor themselves in a social setting. Now, as you know from the Manning reading, Management frequently focuses on visitor satisfaction as an important outcome of visitor behavior. And very simply in this model, satisfaction can be determined by what we expect and what actually happens when we're at the resource under the prevail of a management, management institution. In the Manning reading, emphasis was on the visitor and social factors that influence provision of a satisfying recreation opportunity. We continue with that emphasis in this presentation. So, who is the recreation visitor? Clearly, as Forest Service researcher Alan Wager posited in 1964, an average visitor doesn't exist. And therefore, understanding the differences among and between visitors is really important. Visitors differ on many dimensions. This diversity wheel illustrates six core dimensions of diversity, age, race, ethnicity, gender, physical ability, and sexual orientation and attraction. It also includes several secondary dimensions that all influence preferences for and evaluation of a recreation experience, among other perceptions and behaviors, of course. Now, as you read about, some of these most frequently researched dimensions include the socio-demographic variables of income, uh, age, and gender. Much less has been investigated related to religion or military status, although there is growing research in these areas. Rarely, if ever, are these variables considered isolated or individually because of the intersectionality and in how they relate to each other. For example, age, gender, and ethnicity consistently interact to influence our behavior. An older Asian American woman has some of the same factors that influence her preferences for vis uh, recreation behavior. However, she may have stronger motivations to be with family, which is part of her generation and culture, as well as additional health, language, and safety concerns that might relate to her age. I think it's important to note as well that entire texts have been written on just one of these dimensions. For example, here, race, ethnicity, and leisure. So clearly we cannot be comprehensive in our short time with you today and in these readings, but we wanna give you a good sampling of these dimensions of diversity. We do have examples to share, and here's a close to home example related to some focus groups we did with Hmong travelers and outdoor enthusiasts. So we did focus groups among multiple generations here in Minnesota, and findings reveal that their motivations for and constraints to outdoor recreation and nature-based tourism were very similar to those in non-Hmong populations. They recreated and were motivated to do so because they were interested in being outside for relaxation and to visit attractions. Also, while constrained by time and money, just like everyone else, they had additional constraints. Discrimination and racism in particular. Hmong respondents talked about how they changed their behavior to anticipate in anticipation of this discrimination. So for example, they traveled in groups and stuck together when traveling. Uh, they would caravan. Um, also, their decisions were influenced about where to go and how long to stay based on their travel group as well because they travel with multiple generations and the elder generation expressed concerns about having food availability and comfort. 
Finally, due to their group size, that also dictated where they could travel because they had multiple cars and sometimes lodging and park facilities could not accommodate them. Thus, both age and ethnicity played significant roles in shaping preferences and participation in these respondents' recreation behavior. Now, these types of influences and factors of discrimination and generation can be also understood as particular types of constraints to leisure behavior. Specifically, as Jackson posited in 1993 and later in 97 and 2000 and 2005, constraints are assumed to limit the formation of our leisure preferences, as well as inhibit or prohibit our participation and enjoyment of leisure. So you can categorize these constraints into three areas. Intrapersonal constraints, those that deal with the individual, such as fears and self-perceptions, or interpersonal, and these are trying to combine or coordinate with family and friends to actually do something. And finally, a third category, very broadly, structural. And this includes time and money and could also include the physical environment. These often interact and influence multiple stages of recreation participation. As a college student, perhaps you can relate immediately to the time and money structural constraints. And in fact, the most recent data available from American Time Use Survey data does reveal, in fact, that college students have one hour less for leisure than the general population of the same age. So how does that compare to your lived experience? Uh, American Time Use Survey says you have four hours for leisure and sport. Do you? Beyond time influences, you probably also can relate to the intersectionality of some of these dimensions of diversity and understand how they influence your participation and others' participation in leisure, leisure and environmentally related behaviors. I do want to let you know that more recent and sophisticated models of leisure constraints does include these dimensions of diversity. So while this simple model is useful for big picture understanding of visitor satisfaction, Clearly, it and visitor behavior overall is much more complicated than this model depicts. In terms of that complexity, I hope through this short session you've gained some additional insight into your behavior as well as others' recreation behavior, whether it's a desire for social affiliation, comfort through some motorized camping, or a need to escape. Enjoy the readings for this week.